All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Bridgman. This is Sean Hennessy, and together we are Major Mega. Uh, we have an office downtown nestled behind the courthouse next to Characters Pub. Uh, so if you're ever in the area, stop on in, play some video games, hang out for a little. Um, we just had a nice night with uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, Resolution, I'm sorry, the other day. And we do like game nights and stuff on First Fridays. So. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Quaver, the multiplayer piano. This is a project we recently com uh, completed for the city, uh, for the Keys for the City program. Uh, and basically Quaver is uh, a piano that you can create a song on and instantly upload it to the internet. Uh, so before I say too much, I'm going to show a live demo of uh, Sean giving it a whirl. I guess we're just going to have to use my speakers from my laptop. Yeah, crank it. So if you guys can all just huddle around the mm -hmm. table. In the middle, you can speed it up a little. So we're going to fast forward a little because this process repeats until he has all four layers. As you can probably see, uh, we, you can play up to four quote unquote players. And then once you're all done, you can save and upload it to the internet. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Saving song, making MP3. Uploading song uploaded. And then you can visit keysforthecity.com/slash quaver to download your song. And finally, nice work, Sean. Hey guys. We 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 left that we we had this moment when we were editing this video because um, we blasted this thing all over Reddit and tried to get some publicity out of it and. We're like, all right, should we keep this weird thing in there? You do, or should we not? And we did, obviously, but no one has yet to comment on it, so. Yeah, no comment on the end part yet. So that. So we got this idea, uh, as you might guess, as uh, we walk through the city every day on the way to work. Sean and I are musicians. We often sit down and noodle around on the piano and. You know, our minds were wandering to like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if we could just record this idea right now? Yeah, what if we could upload the internet? Well, I'm sure we all get ideas like that a lot, but then they fade into the ether and we come back down to reality and we get on with our day. But somehow this random idea stuck and Sean ended up sketching this up. And we're like, all right, well, let's, let's email somebody and see if we can make it happen. So we sat down with uh, Music for Everyone, which runs Keys for the City program. And we were pretty convinced that A, they weren't going to get it. And B, if they did get it, they weren't going to go for it. Uh, but as cool as Lancaster is, they immediately got it. And they almost immediately went for it. And within a few days, we had the whole thing greenlit. And we were like, crap, I guess we better figure out how we're actually going to do it. Because we really hadn't put much thought into it besides this. Uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. Right. So, which is cool. And I mean, I would encourage all you guys. I mean, I've, I think we found that the way to push yourself and do new cool stuff is to just kind of sign up for something that maybe you're not prepared for or don't know much about because it really lights a fire under you, <laughs> um, to say the least. So next, uh, yeah, so actually jump back up. I want to say oh, something nice. really, that's good. Uh, so when we first concepted this thing, we wanted it to be super intuitive, super basic. We didn't want to rely on like a computer or touch screen or anything like that. We wanted 
a grandmother to sit down and kind of get how it works. So we originally designed it with just buttons and LEDs, um, but after some thought, we realized, you know what, we are going to need a display because there's just too many scenarios where some kid walks up, starts it, walks away, and the next person has no idea what's going on. So this is kind of a rough diagram of our initial design. Um, we have four player LEDs on the left, red for recording, green for there's something in there playing, and it would be turned off if you're not there yet. Big record button in the middle, uh, basic display above that. Save and upload, play the previous song, and of course, no retro looking machine would be complete without a reset button. Um, that's just kind of the emergency, what if nothing's working or I just want to totally start over button. Um, so, <clears throat> next slide. And I'll just say another thing, Sean whipped that up in Illustrator. We did a lot of things for the first time on this project and we just kind of did it with what we had, even though we knew there's probably some kind of like electronic schematic diagramming software out there. Um, you know, sometimes it, you just gotta like do it with what you know. And we found that throughout this project that was our saving grace to just keep moving. Uh, so the first step, actually the only thing technologically that we thought we had figured out before we pitched it was that, yeah, you know, we'll just, we'll just throw some condenser mics in and put some speakers in and some kind of looping software and it'll just work. But once we actually got the project and we started thinking, we're like, if we put condenser mics in here and there's speakers right next to it playing music, as we build up loops, it's going to be crazy feedback loops and stuff. So we're like, all right, that doesn't work. So plan B, guy in Texas, he's the only one in the world that really does this. Uh, he pretty much makes huge magnetic pickups for a piano and it essentially is a guitar pickup designed for different styles of pianos. It's super cool. And, and I mean, like, he's been doing it since the 70s. And no one else is really like taking him up on it. And his, his webpage is, is full of quotes from Elton John, Ben Sold 5, and all these people because he just like saves the day. Because you can play live, there's absolutely no feedback. So once we got this, we, we called him up. We told him about Lancaster. We told him about the program and all that. And uh, he hooked us up with a refurbished unit. So helpinstill.com if that interests you. Here's a photo of it all put together. Um, so once we had the... Uh, capturing part figured out. Um, for the brains of the unit, I had been itching to play with a Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, and for anybody that's not familiar, a Raspberry Pi is kind of a credit card sized uh, system on a chip. It's a complete computer, quad core processor, a gig of RAM, really awesome little machine. And I, I assumed that this would be plenty of horsepower to tackle this project. Um, so to test it out, we set up a very, very minimal prototype. Uh, as you can see here, just kind of a record and play button. Um, to capture the line input from the help and still, we have this little USB sound card. Uh, that's a C Media audio chip. They are littered in 50 different flavors all over Amazon from $5 to $50, just wrapped in a nicer skin. We got that for eight bucks. We ended up tearing it apart to make it even smaller. It works great. Uh, it's got a uh, Mono input stereo out, which is you know perfect for what we need. Uh, so once it goes through into the sound card, into the Pi, I'm controlling everything uh, via Node. And I was kind of torn whether to go the Node or Python route. That's kind of the two main things that the Raspberry Pi runs on. And when I chose Node, I chose it because I'm a front end guy at heart. That's what I, JavaScript I know best. And I was just kind of assuming that Node would be like a huge performance hit and it wouldn't really be quite as fast as Python. So I did some research and it turns out Node is actually really fast. It's actually just as fast, if not faster than Python in certain scenarios. So I was like, all right, so win-win. It's easier to program and it's faster. Uh, so Node's kind of controlling everything that goes on. Uh, Jack uh, at jackaudio.org, it's a really cool open source audio router. And basically, you can use it. Developers can use it to talk to other programs, and you can use it to route audio from one program to another and make everybody talk and get along. Um, so, to loop the actual sounds, I'm using an open source program called Super Looper. Uh, and if you want to look that up, Super is spelled S O O P. Uh, I was thinking about writing a looper in Chuck, which is a really cool C based library for writing real time audio. And when I saw Super Looper, it was just like, a no-brainer. It did everything we wanted and then some. Uh, 
and you can compile it to run headless with no GUI or anything. So it's, it's super fast. It's kind of meant for embedded applications. Um, so for uh, Node to talk to Superlooper, initially I assumed I was going to use some kind of uh, MIDI protocol. And I noticed that Superlooper also can be uh, used with OSC. And OSC is open sound control. And I wasn't too familiar with it, but I'm now convinced OSC is far superior to MIDI, and I think it's going to either merge or take over at some point. Because with MIDI, if some of you are musicians, you can only do values 0 through 128 in certain parameters. There's only a certain number of channels. Um, and while it's pretty powerful, it is limited in a certain sense. And with OSC, you can send strings, you can send float values, you can send pretty much whatever you want. So it's, you know, you, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, super flexible. So we went with uh, the Node OSC module to talk to the super looper. Um, and then to control all the LEDs and buttons and all that, we're using the on-off module. It basically does what it says. It listens for button presses on and off, and it turns LEDs on and off. Uh, it's pretty basic stuff. The node serial port is what we're using to uh, talk to the display. But I'll get into later. When cross-compiling, I, for the life of me, could not get node serial port to compile. Uh, so doing some further research, I realized with Linux, if you want to talk to the serial port, you can literally just echo commands to it, like super basic. And I was like totally over-engineering the solution there. Uh, so that was kind of a bonus. Uh, so then once we update the display and do all that stuff and make a song, uh, Superlooper can output your composition to a WAV file, which is awesome, high quality, but we're uploading via Wi-Fi. So we use Lane to convert that to an MP3. Uh, and then we kind of realize, basically what you're building here is one measure. So there have been, they've been building the song over and over again. I listened to it 16, 32 times. But then when you actually export the file, it's just one measure. So we realized, well, we actually probably should make this into a song. So FFmpeg concatenates all these MP3s together to make a much longer version of what you've made. Um, and then the final step is getting all this online. And has anybody here used Parse? before or heard of Parse? Cool, because Parse is awesome. It's absolutely amazing. Facebook just bought them maybe a year ago. They have alleviated so much work for me. Uh, it's kind of a back end as a service. And while it won't work in every single application, for really basic scenarios and things you do all the time, like Facebook login and Twitter off and uh, a lot of just random mundane tasks, Parse just does it all for you. Uh, and then not only is it back end as a service, it makes my job easier on the front end because with a few lines of code, I can just go and grab all the songs and get a JSON object back of all the MP3s and when they were recorded and all that stuff. So Parse is really awesome. Parse.com, check it out. That, that display was 80 pixels wide by 8 pixels tall. It was just enough for what we needed. Um, and then they also make a driver module that fits on the back, just backpacks right on. And they make a really basic one that drives just that single display. And then they make the Uber, which can drive like 50 displays and do all kinds of uh, drawings and lines and scrolling and color changes and stuff. So they're, they're a pretty cool company. It's super affordable stuff. That's embedded adventures. Um, so once we got a working prototype and breadboarded out, uh, Sean started painting the piano, which we'll get to later. I started getting my feet wet. I, I never really soldered before. My only adventures in soldering was like putting as much on as possible <laughs> to make sure it didn't come apart, you know? So I was like, all right, I guess we better learn how to do this. So this was just crazy, uh, making this circuit board. Um, I forgot to order wire terminals, so I just had to solder them right to the board. But uh, this cobbler was really cool. Uh, the Pi has GPIO pins on it, which allow you to connect pretty much anything you want to it. And this takes a ribbon cable and breaks it out and labels everything and makes it really easy to uh, hook it up to a board. In the future, I'm definitely going to get something printed. You can even get your logo on it and all kinds of fancy stuff, as I'm sure some of you know. But it was a fun learning process. And believe it or not, I flew blind. I made probably 100 some solders, and we hooked it all up, and everything worked but one LED. So it could have been a lot worse. Uh, here, Sean is starting to go nuts, tearing apart the piano. At first, this was kind of like, it's hard because it's beautiful, perfect 
upright piano and the lady that came and tuned it was talking about how amazing it was and we're like yeah we're going to drill holes in it and paint over it <laughs> so but then once you know you get that first hole drilled Sean was going nuts so it was fun um, here you can see Sean uh, test fitting some of the components uh, we used some of his old Bose speakers from like the 80s uh, you can see the back of the display in there the three buttons uh, the record button um, Sean is beginning to paint the piano. We set up a nice little Dexter laboratory in our office. Um, Sean did this cool method where he projects the artwork onto the side, which helps us, uh, helped him live paint it. Him and his wife killed it. Uh, I did nothing in the paint department. Um, here's a cool time lapse of Sean doing pixel perfect hand brushing. If you get the, the piano, I should say, is that, it's at Park City right now in the food court. Forgot to say that. So if you get over there, check it out. It's really cool. Uh, I no, I threw this in there just because uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know we've all been there with you know blowing past deadlines or last minute projects or you know not meeting expe client expectations. So this is literally probably like 4:30 a.m. and Eight hours ago, we had told music for everyone, oh, yeah, it's ready to go. <laughs> Works great. <laughs> Pick it up tomorrow. You know, tomorrow's a big day. And it was super late into the night. And um, we had finally got everything hooked up and in order. Uh, and uh, we started doing longer loops. Because at first, we only tested like five or 10 seconds. So we started doing like 30, 45 seconds. And as soon as we started doing that, and the second or third loop, it just started totally crushing out. Like the sound just got all garbled, and we're just like, oh my god, what is going wrong? And we tried to quick fix it, and we were just scrambling. You know at that time of night, everything's funny, you're loopy, it's mm -hmm. just. But I had to put this picture in there, because based on the fact that we couldn't get Wi-Fi connected at the time, our cables were only a certain length, we had to like move it halfway through the door. And for like four hours, I was crawling under the desk, popping up. Notice his computer. <laughs> it's like, but in hindsight, it's like. Because it wouldn't fit over here because of the cable scenario. It just, it was so ridiculous. And then the next day, it's like, oh, we could just like use a laptop, you know. It's just, but you're not, you're not, you're not thinking. And we're scrambling. It, it was just, it was, it was a fun night. It was the most fun I've ever had being behind on the project. <laughs> so basically, we got a weak extension. Uh, we're going to hold on that slide for a while. Because I want to talk about, at this point, this was the first huge roadblock we hit. Uh, because for doing a lot of things for the first time, things were going actually surprisingly well. Um, but when this sound distortion started happening, uh, we weren't quite sure where to look. And we just kind of made an assumption that turned out to be false that the Pi didn't have enough horsepower. That this thing wasn't able to keep up with these longer sound files. So we're like, all right, let's just throw more computers at it. So we bought a micro PC. Uh, put Linux on it, put all the same stuff on it, and because uh, Super Looper works over OSC, you can talk to the network, so we were able to keep the Pi running everything just how we had it, but offload the looping part and processing to this new computer. Um, so we hooked up this new computer, which took like another week to like get that all built and set up. <laughs> we hooked it up, and the problem was even worse. It was happening like nonstop. We turned it on, and we were like, all right, here we go. Yeah. Four second loop. Let's do this. It's going to be perfect. Yeah. I was like, it just, it, it, it just, it was even worse. But then the crazy thing happened where I was like, screw it. So I just kept recording. And then like 30 seconds into it, it went away. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And I found that after a while, it would always just go away and be fine. So I did more research, and it turns out that Linux audio is really susceptible to noise whenever the CPU frequency changes, which is a fancy way of saying it goes from 500 megahertz to 900 megahertz. So with things like the Intel Celeron that we were using in the micro PC and the Raspberry Pi, uh, which is all about power saving, they're starting as low as possible and only ramping up if need be. So what was happening was they were handling it fine at 500 megahertz or whatever, and then once we started pushing a lot of audio through it, it would ramp up, and that's when it would start to crackle. So I did a lot of research on CPU frequency scaling, and everybody on the internet said, set the CPU governor to performance, and it, you know, it'll be fine. And I did that. It didn't work. So it did a lot more trial and error. And it turns out if you set the CPU governor to user space, you can manually set 
the, the CPU frequency. And in our case, we put it, we maxed it out, overclocked it to a gigahertz. And it was fine. It stayed there. And it works great. It loops all the audio. So that was just like. And we're back to using just the Pi. Right. And also, we're back to just using the Pi. It was plenty of horsepower. So that was awesome. Um, but then we ran into a second hurdle where we realized almost always a reboot is necessary. Whether you want to do it for the first time because you're walking up to somebody's old creation or you mess up and you want to reboot. And the Pi is notorious for having really long boot times. So you need to cross compile. You need to convert the Intel instruction set to the ARM instruction set uh, through software. So build root lets you cross compile on your Mac or Intel based machine to pretty much whatever you want. So we got like a bare bones system running that would just turn on the Pi and nothing else. And then we just started building from there. Um, got some of the audio software and started building up. And we actually got this thing uh, booting up in 2.7 seconds, which is one of the fastest boots I've ever seen. And that was like the number one question in the hacker news forums and stuff, like wondering how we got that. So that was like an awesome feat. And it's totally like, now that I know a Pi can boot in a few seconds, it's just like blown open the gates to what you can do with it when it comes to like embedded Linux uh, and stuff. So those are the two biggest hurdles we faced. And uh, with that done, we cleaned up the back, uh, got it all working. We used an, we used an amp, a, a pile amp to power the speakers. We ran into a couple uh, random issues with like noise and line level that at this point I know is not the right solution. Um, but we used some guitar pedals and some random stuff to try to solve those issues. It's not perfect, but we actually ended up, the guy from Texas from Help and Still called us like, I'll tell you what guys, I am just so excited about this piano. And we told him about the issues we were having, and he's like, oh yeah, I'm aware of that. I'm working on a new model. So, you know, it, was, so it wasn't all us. It was something to do with this Help and Still putting out a really weak signal. Um, but that was kind of the only problem left unfixed. Um, so that was that, and we boxed it up, shipped it out. And it was about 10.30 at night, and we snuck in the back entrance to the food court. And <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, I threw this in there just because I think whether you're a, a mm -hmm. hacker or a musician or an artist, uh, getting your stuff out there and letting it go into the wild is like a huge pivotal moment. And it's really hard to do sometimes, and I think uh, Sometimes it's prohibited me from even releasing stuff because it's just such a huge hurdle to get over. So this was like the moment where someone else was sitting down who had never used it before and was just playing on it. So we're up in the JC Penny wing. You can actually see it down uh, into the food court. So that was a cool moment. And I think that is it. I'm probably over time. Uh, so if you want to say, do we have time? do about five minutes of questions. Okay, cool. Is that the last slide, Sean? That's the last slide. That's the last slide. Unless you have like 40 duplicates, and then surprise me. No. Any questions? No question, but just a comment. Uh, it's actually interesting because my son and I were playing that this past weekend. Oh, cool. <laughs> was it working well for you? Yeah, it was working okay. great. Good. Now, my son's only five years old. So oh, cool. He was actually tinkering away at it, and I said, we'll try this. And very cool. clear, very concise instructions, work great. Awesome, oh, that's great to hear. So when I saw you guys start to do this, I was like, oh cool, I use that. Yeah. 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 It's awesome to go into Park City and just like see people interacting with it. It's very cool. As you can see from the top there, we have come down and play. And we had to try really, really hard to keep that message uh, PG-13. <laughs> <laughs> You can fill in the blanks there. Um, but we actually, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, do you plan, where else do you have plans to put it? Um, we don't know quite yet. The Keys for the City wants to do a new program next year where we kind of simplify and duplicate this process so they can offer this as like a premium package for sponsors. Um, we'll see if that actually happens or not, but right now that's the only plans. There's talk with the guy in Texas to make a product out of it, but Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a far leap, you know, given the state it's in now. So we're not sure yet. Cool. So. How many MP3s are being generated, and are any of them good? Um, <laughs> yeah, like 
somebody did like the Mario theme song, which is <laughs> awesome, you know? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of chopsticks and heart and soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's fun to go in every day and be like, see, see what people made. Well, we, it's, it's easy, it's probably, to answer your question, it's probably, I would say, five to 15 a day, just depending on the day of the week. Um, we actually know when something's up with it because about eight hours goes by and there's no MP3, and we're like, uh-oh, something's up, so we might pop in the mall, it's happened a couple times. And then somebody wrote to us saying that uh, one of the keys were not working, or multiple keys were not working, so I went and take a look at it, and <laughs> some freaking kid, must have been pounding on it, snapped the hammer completely off, and it flew down like 10 keys and wedged itself into more hammers, and it was a mess. But that's inevitable with these things, you know? Yeah. That's actually kind of what I was going to ask there is, as far as maintaining it, or if you're worried, like, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, it's a Pi project, and it's all, like, wired up, you see all the wires in the back, and they're just kind of, like, connected there. It seems to me like a project like that, I would be so afraid, like, to leave it. <laughs> just let somebody well, no, and that's, that's yeah. kind of why I included that last slide, because it, we knew this thing was going to get beat to death, and we knew Sean's painting was going to get chipped away, and, uh, you know, it's just an experiment. We'll see what happens. Hopefully, being here as opposed to outside on the street, it'll get taken care of a little bit more. Um, but so far, the worst is that snapped, snapped key. Uh, it's going to be there through Christmas, so. Well, one thing we forgot to mention, well, I guess you guys could kind of see, but all the components we had to tuck tightly behind, um, I guess, what the what is the face when you're sitting on it? It's right behind there. We only had like three or four inches, but it's, it's well sealed and um, protected, so.